So who believes it's true? One. Can I get your explanation for this? Well, this is also something we got from the presentation before, that Russia was presented as a power that we don't need to be afraid of, because after all, they are only spending as little in their military budget as Germany does. And now they have learned the hard way that winning a war is such a complicated, time-consuming and expensive operation that no one else needs to be afraid. They are just a paper tiger. And what is happening at the moment is not something Poles or Lithuanians need to worry about. And then there's this other thing about the nuclear threat that China draws a very strict red line and says nuclear weapons are not an option. And you cannot act unilaterally in a situation like this because everything is interconnected as Mr. Steinbrück pointed out in an impressive way in which he connected so many dots that I got the impression that a lot of us got lost because even if we are specialized in one or two or three of the complex areas that he presented to see how A and B in affect C and then there's also D but the underlying assumption is something he doesn't have the time to a lot of people would get lost in the middle of his explanation, but it's great to have people who can talk about the bigger picture without informing us how to implement the policy recommendations. I think that's the luxury of someone who was running for chancellor and coming up with solutions, but then he is a retiree who doesn't need to worry about how to win majorities or how to form a coalition or how to have the stamina to balance the unintended consequences of redistributional consequences in all these disruptive changes, but he knows. And then at least there's something to chew on and to digest in seminars or in academic conferences. So if we only had one person saying this is my minority position, I would love to hear what others have to say about the alternative view. I yes, please. Person, the second person about this, uh, yes. In context, it depends in which context. If we take the situation with the, uh, Ukraine and Russia, uh, I believe that more weapons will not end the war. If, if the European Americans have so much uh, gun left, it will worsen the problem <coughs> and it will bring us to the uh, Okay. Then let me explain why I put this as my second slide. Because the rationale of the West, if there is a rationale, because this was also questioned, we are crazy, we are driven by emotions. We, the West, including myself, being from Germany and the European Union and working for an American university, the idea is a cost-benefit calculation. And it assumes that we are all rational actors who calculate the costs and the benefits. And because my field of interest is the European Union, the peace model, and I kind of steal my next slide, which is referring to this, the peace model of the European Union is that we are all what we are, and if we are different, differences lead to a clash of interests. And for hundreds of years, the clash of interests found ourselves on battlegrounds to find out who's right by using force. And the great civilization step that the Europeans took was to build a different rationale that we become so interdependent that the costs of ignoring the interests of our neighbor becomes prohibitively expensive and we harm ourselves which is a rational cost-benefit driven calculation that works perfectly fine until someone has a different rationale. 
like I want to restore the dignity and pride of something that I consider to be the biggest catastrophe of the 20th century, which is the collapse of my empire. Yeah. If this is the rationale, then I couldn't care less what it does to my GDP, and I don't calculate the costs of lives or whatever, because it's about pride and it's about glory and I want a trophy or whatever it is, but I don't care about the financial costs or in whatever terms you calculate this. So the idea of the West, although we understand that there is something utterly wrong in, with our analysis, if it's possible that this will happen or not, and I can also quote Sarah Wagenknecht from last year, who called everyone crazy who believes that Putin could ever do this. So this is something that we didn't hear today, but just a year ago it was her to tell us we are totally nuts if we believe that this could be a war. This is flexing muscles, this is pushing the West to the negotiation table to demilitarize the Ukraine or whatever, but there will be no war because this is stupid and we are crazy if we believe like this. So the calculation of the West still is if we make it more and more and more expensive and not like you play poker and all in because this would definitely lead to an escalation. You don't leave another choice, but you increase more and more and more and increase the price. Then there is a moment in which maybe not the figure that we identify with what the other side is, but whatever happens behind the facade of the Pontemkin village will come to the point and say, well, now it's getting too expensive for my old boys network or someone else is falling out of a window as the problem solving method that we from time to time hear. But it's all about increasing the costs and whether this is rational or follows the, the right rationale is one of the big question marks if we come to the judgment about is this opinion or is it a fact and is it a strategy and is it coherent and does the West know what we do or what we don't do? The gentleman was patiently waiting. Uh, well, uh, what if the, uh, this logic of raising the cost culminates into threatening the very existence of Russia to the point that the Russian decided to commit a suicide, it's an atomic suicide? <laughs> Seriously? No. Well, that was one of the key arguments that we got, that the threat is on the one hand super limited because Russia is a weak power. It would never be able to uh, uh, attack, attack Poland. But on the other hand, it is this I die in glory and then it's all over. The potential is there. This is definitely something that we have to be aware of and accusing everyone in the West to not being aware of this is in my humble understanding also an underestimation of what we hear and what explains the position of the German Chancellor who was always accused of being too slow and too reluctant and too intransparent and whatever. But it was always about we don't want to be party of war, we should not escalate anything. The moment the nuclear readiness in the Kremlin was communicated, NATO didn't respond. So there are signs of awareness, but of course it's a question of what lens you're wearing. And I introduced myself as this and American affiliation, but I also have the feeling that a number of alternative views strictly analyze on the basis of it's clear who's good and who's bad, which is emotionally understandable because we are raised in a certain way and socialized. And I grew up in the American sector and Sarah Wagenknecht grew up in Soviet friendship. And so there are certain ways of how we see the world or what we consider to be the natural order of things. We all do this, which was my question to Peer Steinbrück to ask him, how can you expect people in an aging society to drop all the core beliefs of what we consider to be the natural order of things? Because there are so many things changing at once. And I think this is part of it because as the SPD was based on a core understanding of 
Handel durch Wandel. We can transform our business partners by engaging, which is a variation of the interdependent story that I described as the peace model of the European Union. Die Linke is strictly anti-American and strongly believes that at the end of the day there is something positive about good relations with Russia or the missed opportunities are truly missed opportunities and not something that was just a bargain chip in a certain period of time. I personally also believe that a lot of opportunities have been missed. Whether there was a serious one is something that history won't tell as history didn't tell whether Stalin was ever willing and able to unite Germany because there's another myth that this whole time of Cold War wouldn't have been necessary if we only would have negotiated in the early 50s. But I'm not an historian, so I'm only making comparisons that work or that don't work. So moving on to the next one. Um, did the EU as a peace project fail if we look at the elephant in the room? Who believes it's right? And if everyone believes it's not right, why do you think it's not right? Because after all, we are not killing each other. <laughs> France and Germany aren't fighting another war. <laughs> They are or they are not? They are not. They are not. And this was one of the key drivers in, in history. So we couldn't stop killing each other. And my grandfather was taught in school that he's supposed to hate the French without even knowing any. But that was the eternal enemy. And that was sort of the key driver and paradigm that we successfully managed to overcome by creating a different narrative. So it's not just about facts, but it's also about storytelling. And if we find the right story to tell, then we make the world a better place. But if the stories collide, or if you assume that the other side is evil, then it might be complicated. And that goes for both sides in a pluralist system. So coming to the next one, which is something I couldn't predict. I didn't know if that is something to discuss here. But I attended the annual foreign policy conference of a party that was born out of civil movements and first and foremost a peace movement, which is the Green Party that is currently in the driver's seat in the foreign office. And it was a military event. They invited not Jens Stolpen, uh, Anders, Anders Rasmussen, the, the predecessor of the Norwegian General Secretary of NATO, and he presented his idea for Ukraine, which boils down mm. to we have to militarize them to the maximum to make it again prohibitively expensive for anyone in the future to ever attack Ukraine. So if you do not only support at the moment when there is still fight going on, but if you go beyond and create a massive military industry there and empower them to be so strong in self-defense that they don't even need us, then this is the best possible security architecture. That was sort of the opening speech for the supporters of a peace movement to listen to what has been said. And then Anna-Lena Baerbock came dressed all black and also reminded us that we should stay strong and firm and support and we have to have the stamina. So it if you wouldn't know where you've been, it would have been complicated to see what's going on. But the biggest question of everyone who came as an external observer was to ask Germans challenging questions. Why does it take so long until you deliver? How do you communicate this? What are the next investment rounds and so on to test German ability to appear as a reliable partner? So asking you, knowing that we are very international, what's your perception of Germany? Can we continue with this happy position that Steinbrück uh, criticized before, that Germans rather want to sit in some sort of um, cozy, nothing's going to change environment in which we count on cheap energy from Russia, cheap products from China, and cheap security from the United States without being asked to pay for it. Mm. And then we can happily develop our export model. Or is there something like this learning to be peaceful and no one wants to see German uniforms outside of area? Is this something 
that is so deeply rooted that you cannot count on us the moment Article 5 or a solidarity clause in the European Union is going to be activated? Or what's your perception of Germany, given that you are in Germany and that you probably have an opinion? So what do you think? Yes. Uh, we experience what they call Zeitenwende on this, in this field. It's been true. They, they have not been reliable. They thought, you know, they don't need any defense budget. Uh, when Trump said it, they all laughed about him. But now uh, the Greens are saying that, what Trump said. And they came to a census, and they call that Zeitenwende. And even Heuskin is on the, uh, on the tour speaking about Zeitenwende. Yeah, well, Zeitenwende is a, is a buzzword, as a lot of other buzzwords, which are important to communicate a spirit, but what it practically means and how it boils down and what the consequences are. This was the strong wake-up call from Steinbrück, that we haven't fully understood what the implications are, and that also goes hand in hand with how reliable we are. Anyone else who wants to comment on how reliable you think Germany is when it comes to security alliance? Yes, please. Well, speaking from Britain, I would say a year and a half ago we would have said no, but now we would definitely say yes, things have changed. I don't know what Zeitung Vendor means, but I can say from, from, from Britain, changed. things have changed. And we see Germany, and we hope desperately that they are reliable partners. Okay. But coming back to your earlier point, turning the tables, how will Russia feel if next door the neighbors are armed with every conceivable weapon? I wonder which of our countries would would put up with that if the tables were turned. The US certainly didn't when nuclear weapons were brought to Cuba. Well, that is sort of the, um, the weak line of argumentation when we highlight how much it is not our decision to tell a country whether it can choose which organization it wants to belong to. Because the term NATO expansion makes NATO look like a cancer cell that grows and grows and grows and every neighbor cell will be infected and then by the end of the growth, the world is sort of NATO territory. While in fact it is a security alliance that offers a certain set of, like it's a club that offers services, like a good, and you have to fulfill certain requirements and then you can decide if this is in your interest or not. So you apply for membership. In NATO's case, it's a relatively low threshold, what you have to fulfill. In the case of the European Union, we see this every day in the news how much it means to fulfill the so-called Copenhagen criteria. You have to be a Western type democracy and we tell you what a Western type democracy is. After everything we heard about the definition of democracies and what to do with the tools of the procedural requirements and so on, you know what that means. You have to be fully integrated into the single market with all the flanking policies and it has to be smooth and we don't like disruptions and you have to be competitive because we don't bail you out. So this is the second part. And the third, you have to implement every single piece of law of something which by now is a truck full of legislation to not only translate into your system, but to live it. Every prosecutor, every judge, every company, every dairy farmer has to produce on the basis of dairy farm regulations brought to us by the European agricultural policy. So this is something that is nothing less than a revolution. So the country that applies is different from the country that is accepted because it goes through a transformation that is not Ursula von der Leyen comes to visit, brings you a questionnaire, and I fill it out in two weeks. <laughs> and then we are ready to be a happy member and everyone benefits from the great advantages of being united. So this is all not trivial and it needs to be taken into consideration. Um, I think I lost one of my points why I started with this, so let's move on to the next one. Um, this, and now I'm talking about the specific one, the elephant, 
is not a territorial conflict, but an attack on the Western model, which is already an interpretation, like a perception. And it is part of the side that has been criticized to be irrational. So is it about, I need a chunk of a neighboring country, although I'm the largest country in the world? Or is it something like, a proxy, whatever, because this is about the beginning of a systemic conflict in which the Western model, so to speak, like politically and economically, is in decline. When we look at global analysis, what Freedom House and other comparative empirical research institutes look at, so then the Western model is shrinking in number and in functioning. and that is the pretext of what has been explained by Steinbrück as a swing from a geoeconomic to a geopolitical situation in the world that dominates when we look at why are people doing what they do. So who believes this is right? Who believes it's not right? So first of all, the ones who say this sentence or this statement is correct. One, can you explain why? Well, it's not first of all a territorial conflict. It's uh, it's more uh, making Russia great again, making Putin a uh, world leader. Maybe not so much an attack uh, on the Western model as those, as I just said. But I, it's not first of all a territorial conflict. I think that's obvious. Yeah, I also think that. The idea of getting a chunk of a neighboring country, especially an old industry chunk that costs you more than you can practically exploit, is not a very smart strategy. But there must be more if you throw in so much and if you take such a risk, because it's also the consequence of being condemned in United Nations decisions, at least the intervention as such has been condemned by how many was it? 141 countries in, the, in this first vote. And so there is something that counts as a political price, what you pay in terms of reputation. So there must be more than that. But the Western reading is that it is an attack on our model and what is being defended in Ukraine is kind of a proxy defense on what we stand for, which underlines that if Ukraine wants to apply to be part of Western organizations, then they prove that they mean it. It's not just something like we want to keep our territory, but we stand for something that we in the long run see as the light at the end of the tunnel that is also needed as a positive signal. This is what we are fighting for. So both sides instrumentalize this way of using the statement for what is happening on the ground. Can then, I just ask a question yes, about please. The point you just, uh, uh, Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, my question is, uh, how about America and the European when they make war, which are proven at the end that it was not true? The case for Iraq and Gaddafi in Libyan. Why they cannot be pursued for what they have done, which is not correct. And why is it being only applied to Putin or other uh, political leaders? Well, I think it doesn't lead us very far if we make it an equation. Like, if someone is doing something wrong, it doesn't legitimize us that something wrong doing by someone else is less wrong, because it's both wrong. Yeah, but these are two separate. These are two separate discussions. The one thing is, what can we do to fix the mess that Westerners created in illegitimate wars? But is it right to draw the conclusion that because there has been wrongdoing in Iraq, we legitimize wrongdoing in another country by another actor? Sorry. Uh, say this was wrong and thousands of people 
Yeah, we do. We do and we respond accordingly. Or in an ideal world, we would have an international organization that is addressing this. And well, apparently Professor we don't have a functioning international organization that is addressing this. But in a country of free speech, we can at least have conferences in which we openly address it and discuss the consequences of this. But to draw the conclusion from because something was wrong in the 2000s with George W. Bush, it's okay if someone else is doing something equally wrong in another country because it's legitimate on the basis of what has been done wrong before. No, that is not what I meant. Yeah. But it is often used as some sort of um, connecting dots kind of argumentation. Yes, please. Uh, Iraq, despite all the attacks, uh, subversion from Iran, Turkey, Syria, and so on, central government is still growing. Part of Iraq. The problem was not the attack. The attack toppled the uh, criminal regime in, the, in Baghdad. The problem is that the Shias and Sunnis in Iraq are not grown up enough to build up their country, to build a country. It's not the idea that the war was wrong. Why in the Kurdish part it is right? Despite all the attacks, the Kurdish part is still growing. Adapting democratic norms, day by day we see progress. The day the ISIS war ended in that region, the, they started growing again. So the war was not wrong. It is the mindset in Baghdad that is wrong. And then the it question is, great, who's, uh, it, who's in it, Baghdad and why? But that is... Yes, Iran another, has, definitely has a another big, part in the big question. So when you closely looked at my introduction slide, it came with a question mark. Because I come from a country in which my generation was educated, war is not an option. And no one wants to see Germany being engaged in whatever. So if there's something like the liberation of Kuwait, we rather send a check. That's perfectly enough, and then no German dies, which is also quite convenient, and we have the means to send a check. So should we prepare for war if we want peace, like the um, former general secretary solution for a massive military investment in a future peace Ukraine that is not a member of whatever? or? Given what has been said about the challenges of the 21st century, we have limited resources and we should rather use our money for making the world a better place and fighting climate change and investing in education and modernizing our health industry and supporting the global south to catch up with living standards that we take for granted. There is such a long to-do list and the financial pressure to get at least parts of it done actually requires a different moral perspective on how we spend our money? Or is the lesson learned that none of this can ever be addressed as some sort of the agenda? Like take my government at the moment. They started with their coalition agreement and said, if this, what we write down in the coalition agreement, will be achieved, Germany will be a different country. So they promised that change is happening and we represent change. Change happened within the first 100 days, but a different change and no one could see it coming. And now everyone who was elected to be busy with climate change or whatever their portfolio was, is frantically dealing with war-related stuff. And not only because it's eating their time and attention, but it's also eating the resources that we urgently need to address pressing problems for the current and future generations. So what's your take? Is this the new world we live in and therefore we have to remilitarize in order to make our countries and the world a better place? Or what's your take at the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy? I guess we are kind of biased if we spend our days in conference rooms like this. Yes, please. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm only a guest at the ICD. We so are all guests. I'm only a guest at ICD. Um, but until a year and three months ago, I lived in Finland for three decades almost. And um, 
They have obligatory military service until today. Two of my sons went through military service because they have to, and they do it happily. And um, it's a very peaceful country, I think, as, if, as everyone knows. And they avoided NATO, they, avoid, they wanted to be neutral, because we have, or Finland has, the second largest border with Russia, more than 1,000 kilometers. So we have always had that military training for everyone, because, and the F Finnish army is well prepared. I believe it's something similar in Switzerland, but they don't have a border with Russia. And um, 20, uh, 2014, I believe, it was when Putin threatened the Baltic countries. And I remember I was thinking, and I was not so politically you know, into every detail, oh, he's just a small, physically small guy playing macho, but then he also threatened Finland. You know, <coughs> saying, okay, we can take Finland in a, in a day without bloodshed if I want to. And I'm, you know, what statesman makes jokes or not jokes <laughs> about this kind of a thing? So I happen to be in Lapland for some issue and, you know, recruits there from Lapish families who are in the military, in the military service from Monday to Friday and work as tourist guides for their families on Saturday and Sunday. He told me, we are scared. That was 2014, right, in the autumn. And then he said, if they decide to come through the north, you know, what will we do? Because they took it seriously. So I'm just saying, um, and now that they invaded Ukraine, still the NATO discussion, there was always people for and there was people against. And now that the invasion came into Ukraine, Finnish people immediately <laughs> made this decision, we want into NATO. And I know the Baltic countries, it was not, you mentioned this earlier about the expansion. NATO, uh, NATO was not a cancer coming. The Estonians wanted away from the threat of a c huge country that is not exactly democratic, you know. <coughs> Just what I wanted to point out that uh, you are saying there, uh, I'm extremely for peace. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work for peace, but as long as you have, a, you know, people you can't trust, you need to be able to defend yourself. I just want to give Finland as an example as a very well prepared, militarily, country. You heard about the underground tunnels, you know. <laughs> yeah. Thank so you. So for those of you who yes. are into Professor, conspiracy theories. One could think that I staged this and I made her ask this intervention because that is my next slide. But there's an intervention from Pakistan. Yeah. Okay, after listening to this Finnish experience, I'm thinking that one day Putin can say that I can attack on Vatican. God forbids. God forbids. But <clears throat> the question is, uh, why all the stress and the focus is on Germany? There is a Conspiracy theory in Pakistan, I have heard in some international relations department that uh, likely that America wants to weaken Europe and Germany. So that's why they want to involve them. But uh, coming back to the <coughs> comparison made by our friend uh, of the Iraq and why the, um, why, the, why the Putin and why, the, why these people who were in vain involved in this war which was totally on a wrong uh, hypothesis and it, they accepted that their hypothesis was wrong. <coughs> Why they cannot be taken into Hague? The issue is, uh, according to me, the this this situation gives leaders like Putin a situation or a, a edge that if something is not happening against them, it won't be happen against us. Or if even it is happen, then it will it won't have a legitimate acceptance or legitimacy around the world, because whenever you will have a case against uh, Putin in Hague, the question will be raised or question should be raised that why the other people who have not be, who have accepted that they killed millions of people on the wrong exemption uh, hypothesis, why they were not asked. What it does it actually, it does the work of the human rights defenders, the peace activists, and the social activists very fragile at community level. Yeah. When they want to work for equality, non-discrimination, justice and peace, these kind of blunders actually, they hamper the peace at a public level, and even the, even, even the tactic of the cultural diplomacy 
it just become jokes thank you just just wanted to comment on that on a very happy note which i think is another reminder we touched upon this several times in the different interventions that we urgently need a renewed international order because the order that we currently have represents the balance of power of post world war II, and we just got francois villons but we have vital interests why would we possibly give up our security council seat in a world that has been changing all the time and we have not only a different balance of power within the Western countries, but also the rise of China and the rise of everyone else that urgently needs a new balance. And as long as this balance isn't there, the ones who make the rules make rules that serve their interests, which is perfectly understandable because this is why they are elected. But it doesn't really represent the outcomes and how we use international institutions like the Hague or international forms of prosecution. All of this is part of a problem that the international order has to be reformed. And if it's not reformed based on negotiations, it's reformed the hard way by changing the balance of power in proxy wars like the one that we are currently discussing. So as a consequence of this, countries that are free to choose like Finland, comes to the conclusion that, yes, I'm a member of the European Union. The European Union has a very explicit solidarity clause that if something happens to Finland, we are all invited, we the, the other 26, to support Finland. Their calculation is simply, it's nice to have, but there are two important factors missing. The one is the United Kingdom, the other factor is the United States. And if we join NATO, they are in. And therefore, sorry to everyone who grew up with a natural order of things that we are perfectly neutral, but we can't afford this anymore. And that's why, as a consequence of a war that is meant to change the balance of power in Europe, NATO and the European Union are urged to ex expand with all the consequences that it does internally, both to NATO, but even more so to the European Union, or maybe that's my personal bias that I simply know a bit more about this, but it has far-reaching consequences regarding the efficiency and the effectiveness of what this club can provide to its members. Which brings me to the next point. If we don't manage to fix it, how about China? Because what we heard before about India plays an important role as someone who steps in, and China equally like 36 times she and Putin met before to express the unlimited support and tralala. -la. And then we saw a number of red lines that should be taken into consideration. Yes, Mark gave me a sign that I should speed it up so I don't make a, longly, a lengthy a lengthy question of who believes this and who doesn't. I attended a sort of expert meeting last Wednesday in which the Chinese representative made it very clear that China has no appetite in being a moderator or an actor to push or do whatever, because at the end of the day, it's in China's interest. Russia will be dependent on China. There is no other way, like sure, India, but that's a different form of dependency. So Russia will be weakened and we, because the war is happening in Europe, will also be weakened. So the ones who benefit in this geopolitical rebalancing process will be the United States and China. So I didn't get tired in Chinese television interviews to press the button and say, it's your job, you have to do it, it's important, it's a war, it's not a military or uh, intervention, but when we look at what's the interest, qui bono, they have all the reasons to step back and watch what's going on. So that brings me to the analysis of how does it change. I mentioned this already. We also don't need to further discuss this. And so <laughs> what brings us to what are we talking about here is not only what is Zeitenwende, but what is our different understanding of what's going on? Because that was the other point of the Chinese who said, you guys even do not know what you want. 
And as long as you don't know what you want, you cannot ask us if we support you, which makes it kind of difficult. But that again underlines that it's not only that we don't know what we want, but we also don't have equal interests with Ukraine. Ukraine tried several times to make NATO and the European Union party of war, because then it's easier for them to not just fight alone, but to fight side by side with whatever. And their calculation of is there an escalation risk that this will be the end of the human species on this planet is something that they can handle if it's a matter of survival. So from that perspective, it's call it cynical, but understandable as an act of self-defense. But everyone else in the West is fully aware of what the consequences are. So we play on the one hand, we stand united and firm. And on the other hand, if you ask everyone in the United West, mm -hmm. what is your position, then it comes down to we are pluralist societies and I strongly disagree with what has been said a few times that there's only one way to look at things, even if media might be 90% in favor of a certain perspective, while people, especially in Eastern Germany, coming back to the socialization effect, strongly disagree with what the government says. If this is what's happening, then by default, we are a cacophonic orchestra. <laughs> Because if we are different, then our differences lead to a different perception, a different where we are located and how we are affected. How, do we have ties or not? Did we import energy? Everything is different. And therefore, our analysis comes to different conclusions. And that brings us to different ideas about how to end this other than we don't want people to die. That would be a common denominator that everyone can subscribe to. But that makes it also very difficult to find something like a plausible position that you can hand in when my starting assumption is right that there is no military solution. Because of course there is a diplomatic solution needed, but based on what assumptions if divide and govern is a successful strategy for everyone who is also interested in weakening the West. So I have a bunch of ideas and conclusions, but since I got this warning of you got to finish this, I admire your stamina because no one fell asleep. In my case, it was easier because as long as I'm talking, the likeliness that I do fall asleep is quite low. And now Mark comes to say thank you and good night. And on this happy note, thank you. And I hope it was a bit of an inspirational contribution.